Welcome to Running Disability Studies and Health Humanities Programs. This is going to be a roundtable discussion with Aaron Lamb, Jonathan Messel, Amy Hemrai, Margaret Price, and moderated by, my, uh, moderated by myself, um, Marion Carici. Um, so I'll start by introducing myself. Um, again, I'm Marion Carici. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a lecturing fellow in the Thompson Writing Program and co-director of the Health Humanities Lab here at Duke. I teach disability studies themed writing courses, serve as faculty advisor to Duke Disability Alliance and director of a faculty working group called the Disability and Access Initiative. Um, we have live captioning available to our audience. So if you would like to view the captions, please click the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you have any access questions or concerns, please send a message to Eli Meyerhoff through the chat. Um, there will be time in the latter half of this roundtable discussion for audience members to pose questions of their own to the panelists. And I invite you to post these questions in the chat or you can use the raise hand feature of Zoom. This event is hosted by the Health Humanities Lab at the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute and sponsored by the Human Rights Futures Grant at the Duke Human Rights Center. Special thanks are due to Professor James Chapel and Dr. Eli Meyerhoff for making this event possible. Special thanks are also due to the students of Duke Disability Alliance who helped provide publicity for today's conversation as a kickoff to Disability Pride Week um, for which they are collaborating with other student groups across campus to host no fewer than 10 events across this week. Um, I'm going to just quickly um, drop a link to the Web page for Disability Pride Week into the chat. Um, so if any of you are interested in checking out any of these other events that are happening this week, you can go ahead and take a look and all of the information is at that link. Um, so to provide a little bit of context about what brings us here together today, um, we in the Health Humanities Lab have been working for many years to build relationships and enable collaborations between arts and humanities faculty on the university side of campus and physicians and health professions workers on the medical side of campus. Our biggest goal now is to make sure that students can reap the rewards of these collaborations through the curriculum. So we have been working on a proposal for a new minor in disability and health humanities, and we're hoping to finalize that proposal soon. Um, so you might be wondering why disability studies, why the health humanities? So I'll just offer some brief definitions of those fields to any who might be new to one or the other. Um, the field of disability studies challenges the norms of medical culture and civic life by amplifying the voices of people with disabilities who as 26% of the US population and over 20% of the global population constitute the world's largest minority. Disability studies helps us to imagine a more radically inclusive and interdependent society and engages with research in all disciplines to advocate and improve quality of life for people of all abilities. The health humanities explore all dimensions of interaction between the arts, the humanities and the study of human health. The health humanities illuminate cultural factors impacting population health, as well as the social determinants of health across the lifespan, including the effects of structural racism, sexism, ableism, xenophobia, socioeconomic inequality, and environmental injustice. This interdisciplinary field is proven to improve medical education and healthcare practices while giving a holistic understanding of the human experience. My own role in the work of growing these fields at Duke has been an effort in community building through the student organization, Duke Disability Alliance, which I mentioned earlier, and through the Disability and Access Initiative Faculty Working Group, which provides exposure to disability studies scholarship across the disciplines and hosts discussions on accessible, anti-racist, decolonial, and abolitionist pedagogy. We have a significant and always growing number of faculty here at Duke who are actively incorporating either disability studies or the health humanities, sometimes both um, in their courses. Our student interest group in disability studies and the health humanities has grown to over 250 members. And I have lost track of the number of students currently proposing or pursuing self-designed majors in these fields through program two. 
it feels like I get at least one email a week from a different student who's interested in doing this. Um, so in order to learn something about how we can actualize this, how we can propose, launch, and run a curricular program in disability studies and the health humanities, we come together now to learn from those who direct and or teach in similar programs at other universities. Um, so I will now introduce our four wonderful panelists. We are so grateful to all of you for coming to join us today. Um, so I will read a quick bio for each panelist and then I'll pause to allow that person to say hello and, and wave to the audience um, just so that folks can put um, a, a face to the name. Okay, so first is Erin Gentry Lamb. She, her pronouns. Um, Dr. Lamb is faculty lead of the Humanities Pathway at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, associate professor of bioethics, and co-director of the undergraduate bioethics and medical humanities minor. Prior to joining Case Western, Dr. Lamb served as the director of the Center for Literature and Medicine and Herbert L. and Pauline Wentz Andrews Professor of Biomedical Humanities at Hiram College, home to North America's first baccalaureate program, our first baccalaureate major in health humanities. Dr. Lamb's key research and teaching interests include aging, death and dying, disability, healthcare and social justice, new biotechnologies, and pedagogy. The fields of age studies and health humanities are both still in formation, and Dr. Lamb has helped to build key professional organizations in both of these areas. She co-founded the North American Network in Aging Studies in 2013, and has served on the steering committee of the Health Humanities Consortium since its inception in 2015. Um, and as a matter of interest, Dr. Lamb will be co-chairing the Health Humanities Consortium for the next three years. She has co-edited the field-defining textbook, Research Methods in the Health Humanities, with Craig Klugman and co-authors the comprehensive report on baccalaureate health humanities programs in the United States with Sarah Berry and Tess Jones. So Erin, if you wanna just say a quick hello. Hi everybody. It's an honor to be here with you today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jonathan Metzel, he, him pronouns. He is the director of the Department of Medicine, Health and Society at Vanderbilt, where he is also the Frederick B. Rentschler II Professor of Sociology and Psychiatry. He received his MD from the University of Missouri. And while completing his residency in psychiatry at Stanford University, he also completed a Master of Arts in Humanities and Poetics, and later went on to receive a PhD in American Studies from the University of Michigan. Winner of the 2020 Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Book Award, the 2020 APA Benjamin Rush Award for Scholarship, and a 2008 Guggenheim Fellowship, Dr. Metzl has written extensively about race and health, the history of mental health and psychiatry, gender, and politics. His books include The Protest Psychosis, Prozac on the Couch, Against Health, How Health Became the New Morality, and finally, Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland. Welcome, Jonathan. Thanks so much. It's great to be here, and it's great to see so many friends. I wish we were hanging out in person, but Zoom is a good, good backup. So, hey, everybody. Thanks, Jonathan. I wish we could all be together in one place as well. That would be amazing. Um, maybe next year. Um, okay, our third speaker is Amy Himrai they, them pronouns. Um, they are associate professor in the Department of Medicine, Health and Society at Vanderbilt University with a secondary appointment in the American Studies program. They are also director of the Critical Design Lab, a multidisciplinary arts and design collaborative that pursues collective access by centering disability culture and amplifying the challenges disability culture raises to existing social and built environments. Hemrai's interdisciplinary scholarship bridges critical disability, race, and feminist studies with architectural history and science and technology studies. Their monograph, Building Access, Universal Design and the Politics of Disability, is the pioneering critical account of universal design, investigating 20th century strategies for designing the world with disability in mind. Hemrai's writings, as well as their teaching, 
also explore the complex relationship between access and knowledge, pursuing new techniques for universal design for learning. Welcome, Amy. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Okay, and last but not least, we have um, Margaret Price, she, her pronouns. She is director of the Disability Studies Program at Ohio State University, where she is also associate professor of English. Currently, Professor Price is at work on a mixed methods investigation called the Disabled Faculty Study, which combines survey and interview data to learn more about the experiences of disabled faculty in higher education. Her forthcoming book, Crip Space Time, drawing on findings from this study is under contract with our very own Duke University Press. Price's first book, Mad at School, Rhetorics of Mental Disability and Academic Life, won the Outstanding Book Award from the Conference on College Composition and Communication. Price is co-PI of the Transformative Access Project and received a 2020 Fulbright Research Award. She is an avid knitter and inline skater and is usually accompanied by her dog, Ivy. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you so much, Marian. I feel compelled to say that I'm actually knitting right now. And there's not one but two dogs with me. Oh, one is my little tiny dog, Ivy, who looks like a brown smudge in a blue bed right now. And one is my bigger dog, Otis, who's a big black lab mix. Oh my gosh. I, hope that no, we I love that they made it into the bio. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we get to see more of them. Um, okay. Yeah, wonderful. And, and potentially my cat as well, um, who likes to jump on top of the table while I'm teaching or running Zoom meetings. Um, okay, so to start us off, um, I have shared with the audience a little bit about what it is that each of you does, and I would love to give each of you the opportunity now, and I'll call on you in turn, I suppose, um, to tell us why you do it, right? Um, so how did you first get interested in the health humanities, disability studies, or both? Um, and what do you see as being the value of this work? Right. So I guess the question could be boiled down to, you know, for those of you who have had experience building, proposing, launching and teaching in these kinds of programs, what is it that motivated you to take that step? Um, so I'm just going to call folks in order in which they appear on my Zoom screen. Um, so if we're OK with that, um, could we start with Amy? This is Amy speaking. Um, sure, I can go first. So um, I first learned about disability studies when I was a first year in college from Rosemary Garland Thompson, um, who eventually became my PhD dissertation advisor, like many years later. Um, that was around the time that I was first coming into my identity as a disabled person, and I discovered through this guest lecture in a gender studies class that I was taking, um, that there's a whole field of disability studies in the humanities um, that questions like the cultural values underlying um, disability and you know, the treatment of disability as um, uh, what Mitchell and Snyder call the master trope of disqualification. Um, and so I became very interested in the field and eventually went to graduate school in gender and sexuality studies um, in a department that had a few disability studies scholars, including Rosemary. Um, and then I got a job in the Center for Medicine, Health and Society working with Jonathan. Um, and during my time there, um, in addition to my scholarship, I was doing a lot of design work um, and trying to kind of intervene into some of the ways that uh, disability design happens in university settings, often funded by the Department of Defense and these sort of like high tech prosthetics and things like that. And trying to think about the way that folks in disability culture um, use design and technology as well. Um, and so that's kind of the framework that I use in my work. Erin? Hi, this is Erin. Um, I think it's really interesting to ask origin stories because I imagine that everybody um, has a really different one. I know that I fell into health humanities. So um, 
I was trying to figure out what to do for graduate study and every discipline has baggage. So I went with English because you get to read a lot of books. Um, and I came to Duke where I got to work with Priscilla Wald. Um, but you know, by the time I graduated, I wanted to talk about aging and uh, my dissertation had literature in only two chapters. Um, thank you Priscilla for letting me get away with that. Um, and there was a job ad for a position at Hiram College uh, where they wanted somebody to teach courses among them literature and aging. You know, I, oh. I had thought that these courses were gonna be huge by the time I graduated and they weren't, but to see that they actually existed was so exciting. So I went to Hiram um, and I hadn't really heard the words health humanities or medical humanities so much before that. Um, but Hiram has a long history of being tied in. We also, by the way, have the current director of the Center for Literature and Medicine on this call, as well as um, another one of our biomedical humanities professors, go Hiram. Um, and so, you know, it was a process of figuring out, oh, this is a field. Join these listservs. They have these conferences. These are cool journals. Um, and so a really, really exciting way to get tied in. Um, and this isn't really speaking to your full question, but in terms of what motivates you, uh, health humanities is great because it is like for faculty, I think it's often like a playground. Um, it is an invitation to teach about the things that we care about most and that we are passionate about. Um, and you know, there's really no such thing at the moment as like the survey course that you have to teach. Um, so for faculty, I think it's just a really fun field to be a part of. Margaret. Okay, next. I love this question too. And actually, I think one of my favorite things to do when I gather with people is to tell uh, stories of origin and stories of beginning. Um, I've always wanted to go to work in ways that allowed me to think about and try to change the world. Um, I've always been extremely idealistic that way. And I had actually a uh, several careers before I went to get my PhD and was a professor. Um, I worked as a journalist at a weekly. Um, I was a freelance writer. Uh, and um, I also, along the way, got an MFA degree. Um, that was at the University of Michigan. And while I was getting my MFA, I made friends with a scholar there named Toby Siebers, uh, who had just written um, a, a really well-known now piece called My Withered Limb. And I read the piece and it spoke to me so deeply. Uh, I had uh, been assigned a, a very serious um, chronic illness when I was young, assigned, diagnosed with, uh, and um, I, so I had grown up understanding myself to be ill, but I had never uh, thought about what the notion of disability might have to do with that. Uh, and Toby and I became friends and he was incredibly generous with his time and incredibly generous with his thinking. Uh, so I ultimately, after some more uh, <laughs> tries it different directions, um, ended up getting a PhD and uh, deciding that this was the thing I wanted to pursue, the study of disability um, as a concept. To me, when I first began learning about disability studies in the mid 1990s, it very much was about uh, rights and amplifying the voices of disabled people. And I think that uh, in the 25 years since then, um, it's taken a turn that uh, is one I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about, which is um, a, a turn away from individual bodies and a turn toward thinking about um, what we mean when we say things like that's normal or that's fit or even that's human. Um, and as a philosopher and a rhetorician, uh, I'm, I really like to spend a lot of time thinking about questions like, when do we think something is broken and when do we think it's whole? When do we understand ourselves to be in distress and when do we understand ourselves to be well? Uh, and, though, and I also have a deep passion for then taking those very abstract kinds of questions and saying, what would that change about the ways I interact with people right now, today? Um, and so I've been incredibly privileged to be able to work in disability studies all the time. Um, I started out teaching at a, a small HBCU in Atlanta and then made the move to Ohio State, 
which is in some ways, Ohio State is kind of the opposite institution of a small HBCU for women. Uh, but at both places, I've gotten to focus on disability studies. And um, I, uh, I can't imagine uh, not loving what I do every day, even though a lot of aspects of it are the, the bureaucratic parts are difficult. We'll probably get to that part too today. <laughs> Jonathan? Well, thank you. This is Jonathan. I would, I would say um, I, I came the reverse direction to some other people, um, in, particularly into medical humanities. I, was, um, I went to a, a six-year medical school out of, out of high school, um, which is a, a really interesting experience for somebody who doesn't quite know they want to be a doctor. Um, but it, it was this kind of great BA MD program. They basically automatically give you a BA in biology just for showing up. Um, but the trick is you can quit um, five and a half years into the six year program and you still won't have a college degree. So really they, they have you hooked um, because every, every, all the degrees would come at the end. And so I thought, man, this cannot be right. And so um, I ended up taking actually an extra year and going to night school um, and getting a BA in English. I actually um, was three hours away, still am from a BA in biology and on principle did not get the VA in biology. So I, I came out of it uh, with the, I was the first student in the six year med school to come out with a BA in English and an MD. Um, and then um, I was doing my residency at Stanford and it was kind of similarly furtive in that um, I was working in psychiatry and working in the psych emergency room. And it was fantastic to learn about the biological basis of mental illness and all these great treatments and the excellent collaborations that we were having with the pharmaceutical industry to the benefit of like hot lunches and all these kind of things. But everything from the patient interaction to the doctor interaction to the system interaction seemed to be uh, like for me profoundly political. Um, so even things that patients were coming in with, um, you know, I felt like we were rightly, I mean, diagnosing in people's brains. Um, things that were also very clearly social and political um, factors having to do with racism and disparity and uh, stigma and all these factors. And so I, I yet again snuck away um, and there was a great master's program at Stanford um, and I ended up getting a master's in poetics, um, going to night school and studying with Diane Middlebrook um, at Stanford. And uh, and that was really kind of the change for me because I thought, man, I could, I can do these things and I don't have to like, I mean, when you're doing residency, you don't want to hear like, oh, you have so much time that you can go get a master's. It, that wasn't the case. It was like giving up on the sleep I had, but it was like, oh, how could you do that or something? But it was possible. But then I thought there must be a way to kind of join these things. And so when I finished my residency, there was a great program, the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. Um, and it was a program set up for doctors who wanted to get other education. And they very generously, I went to Michigan and studied with uh, Joel Howell and Toby Sievers, my very dear friend who I miss very much, um, and ended up getting a PhD in American studies um, at Michigan while I was working as a psychiatrist. And so for me, it was kind of a stepwise process of on, really honestly not rejecting the knowledge basis of medicine and neurology and psychiatry but also just seeing how embedded those were. And, and in a way, uh, my career started off in these, you know, day school and night school and real school and fake school. And really what I came to see was I was studying the same thing. It was just different, different versions of the same thing. And so after, after finishing the PhD, um, there, there wasn't a medical humanities program per se at, at Michigan. And uh, the way we created one, and uh, we can talk about administration later, was um, we got a huge grant from the Department of Education. So we, we started off by getting the funding for it and started a program called Culture, Health, and Medicine. And at the time, nobody thought that there was a market for it in a way at Michigan. And within two years, we had like 9,400 students or something. It was Everybody's like, how did that happen or something? And so it was kind of like the student demand then created more resources, which created more infrastructure, which created more need. And so it, it kind of created its own institutional sense. And in that way, that's kind of what 
why why I ended up at uh, coming coming to Vanderbilt was um, I think when you're doing a I'll, I'll just say maybe a go at, go at your own path um, all along the way everybody's like um, well what job are you going to get at the end of all that stuff and now I can say yeah I was just training to be director of MHS at Vanderbilt because that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of how, how it worked out but it, it's been nice to see that. In the beginning, it was a very isolating pursuit, and now there's this whole structure and great colleagues and, and stuff like that. Thank you. This is Marion again. Um, thank you all so much for sharing those stories of origin. And, and what I'm hearing um, in all of those origin stories is a sense of the kind of happenstance way by which we come to these fields. It's often a sort of you know surprise encounter when we get to college for the first time or when we get to graduate school for the first time or we see even a job ad, we're at that latter stage um, that we can kind of come to this. And it sounds like for all of us on this call, like that moment um, changed our lives. You know, just when we discovered that we're not alone in our interests, that there's this whole community out there. Um, and that definitely jives with my own experience because when I first discovered disability studies in my second year of my graduate, my PhD program, um, it was sort of like I finally found something I didn't know that I had always been looking for. Um, and it was kind of similar. I just needed a class. I needed another class. And in the English department, we could um, we could cross list courses from any other department. And so I didn't, there weren't enough classes that appealed to me that semester within English. And I looked over at the history department and there was a disability history class taught by Dr. Michael Rembus. And I took it and just, you know, everything just went from there and my whole life changed. My project changed and the kinds of jobs I was looking for changed. And it gave me a sense of belonging, but also, you know, it didn't only impact my work. It also had a huge impact on my personal life and relationships and just like, you know, engagement with the world as like a, as a social citizen. Um, and I see so much value in that, um, that it sort of gets me to um, my next question, which is about students. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, I feel a sense of responsibility to make that discovery possible for more students um, because it's, it's been the case for me teaching writing 101s that are themed on disability studies that a lot of students, you know, come and take that class and it changes things for them. It changes the way that they, they think about things. It changes how they view their sibling relationships or whatever other experiences they've had with disability, sometimes their own lived experience. Um, it changes sometimes what they want to do for a career. And it, feels too random, you know, that they just happened to take my writing 101. And I, I want there to be a little bit more of like a, an awareness that this field exists. And I want that to be general. And so one part of that is just making sure that we can build a program at this university. But there's also the broader work, the kind of work uh, that Aaron is doing of just increasing um, the presence of the field on a national level and creating, you know, those those organizations and um, areas of, of networking. Um, and before I get to the, those national questions, I do want to start by talking about students and our responsibilities to students. So um, I would love to hear uh, what kinds of student interests um, these programs uh, tend to appeal to. And I, I think I'm going to take this question um, sort of one discipline at a time, if that makes sense. So if I could hear from uh, the disability studies folks first. So that would be, I guess, Margaret and, and Amy. Um, if you could talk about the kinds of students that come to disability studies, you know, um, what kind of interests did they have before they discovered disability studies? What kind of interests do they build on when they discover that disability studies exists? Um, and what kind of impact do you see the, the program having on them? Um, so yeah, if we could start with Margaret, that'd be great. Absolutely. Uh, this is Margaret now. Um, I loved getting your questions ahead of time, Marian. Thank you so much. And it really uh, helped me do some good thinking about our program, which was also very timely because I have a meeting with my chair tomorrow. <laughs> 
Uh, so one of the things I looked at was uh, what colleges at Ohio State do the disability studies minors come from? Uh, we currently have 134 students in the disability studies minor and uh, almost, actually a little more, than, no, almost half uh, come from our College of Arts and Sciences, about 76. Um, and then our next biggest group is from the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. So that is students in occupational therapy, um, other uh, health related disciplines. And then we have a big chunk in education and a few from the College of Nursing, which is a separate school uh, and the School of Agriculture. Um, so, and, and pre-med students are uh, scattered across those schools, but as probably everyone knows, pre-med students now, a lot of them come from a college of arts and sciences. Uh, so the person who set up the disability studies program at OSU is Dr. Brenda Jo Brueggemann, B-R-U-E-G-G-E-M-A-N-N. Oh, I see our captionist wasn't able to grab that. So I'm just going to write it in the chat. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so um, Brenda um, was really smart about the way that she set up this minor and uh, the two core courses in the minor. One is introduction to disability studies, which is housed in English. And one is uh, the disability experience in the world which is housed in uh, speech and hearing sciences. So uh, all students who do a disability studies minor automatically have at least one course in a discipline that's uh, quite unfamiliar to them. Um, so we have lots of students going into, for example, uh, speech therapy or occupational therapy who uh, intro to disability studies as one of their very few humanities courses and perhaps their only English class. And then we have a lot of students for whom the converse is true. Uh, they're English majors or history majors uh, or design majors, and they have to take speech and hearing sciences uh, for at least one course in their minor. Uh, what I find teaching the disability studies courses is that students' sense of understanding that disability studies is much more than they thought is a constant, almost a constant across student feedback. Um, both anonymous feedback and just the kind of stuff you pick up anecdotally uh, in meetings with students, or I also supervise all the disability studies professors, so I hear their impressions as well. Um, students who may come uh, to the topic of disability with a more medical or um, science-centered point of view uh, tend to say, oh, I didn't think about uh, there is such a thing as disability culture or um, disability arts is such and such, or I've now rethought my notions of what it means to help someone. And conversely, and this is especially important to me when I teach disability studies, it's really critical to me that we think about the ways that, I think Jonathan alluded to this, uh, science, medicine, technology studies, humanistic studies, social sciences, these really shouldn't be seen as being at odds with each other in the study of disability. So it's really critical to me to teach students about various methodologies. Um, I'm a big methodology nerd, so I, come to co I tend to come at it through methodology and say, let's think about what the word validity means across different methodologies. Or let's think about what the word art might mean between these different sites. Uh, and that's something that students uh, comment on really specifically. Um, and I, I don't think they know that they're getting a different view than a lot of disability studies programs might offer, uh, but it's one they certainly value. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention is that, and I'm, I'm trying to sort of tilt toward our undergraduate students here because I know you're working on an undergrad minor. Uh, I really wanna brag on our grad students as well. Uh, but one thing I've really noticed among our undergraduate students is that uh, they tend to move toward uh, heavily interdisciplinary projects. So one student I'm thinking about, I'm putting his name in the, uh, in the chat, is Addison Torrance, who's working on a project in a major he designed himself uh, that he has titled Neurohumanities. 
Um, he's studying the discourses of medical school admissions requirements, which is a project I'm incredibly fascinated by. And then a student who graduated a few years ago, uh, Anna Volker, I've put her uh, name in the chat as well, uh, was really passionate about studying um, access to science education. Um, so for her senior project, she designed an accessible planetarium exhibit that involved, uh, she actually designed and 3D printed at what she called a tactile globe. Um, but the globe was actually uh, uh, um, the, the converse or the relief of what you would see if you were a sighted person looking at the ceiling of a planetarium, which looks like a scooped out shell with the constellations on it. Um, and Anna designed something uh, that is pretty commonly used uh, for um, blind, uh, certain kinds of blind theater productions, which is a, a tactile aid to a, a visual event. Um, so I'm, I mean, as you can tell, I'm incredibly enthusiastic about the work our students are doing. Um, probably a refrain today is going to be, we have so much interest, there's so much excitement, we need more people. <laughs> we need more staffing and we need more funding always to help us uh, just manage all these folks doing this great work. Thank you so much, Margaret. This is Marion again. Um, I wanted Amy to speak to this question as well, but I wanted to also clarify the differences between OSU's program where you have a disability studies minor um, versus Vanderbilt in which um, you, you have a Department of Medicine, Health and Society that features an amazing disability studies scholar in Amy, um, but it's not explicitly a disability studies program. Um, so yeah, Amy, I'd love to hear about your student experiences. This is Amy speaking. Um, so our program is an interdisciplinary pre-health major. Um, that's one way to describe it. It has a number of tracks. Um, so students uh, can specialize in medical humanities or critical health, but they can also specialize in public health or health behavior and economics. So there's really kind of a wide range um, and that reflects the faculty that we have. Um, I teach one of the core courses called Theories of the Body that students across the tracks can take. And so, that is one of the courses in which I teach disability studies. I also teach um, a course about designing cities. Um, that's a kind of critical public health and disability studies course. Um, I'm going to teach a critical disability studies class for the first time this coming fall. Um, and so, you know, most of my students are not electing into disability studies necessarily, but they are learning a lot from it because they are also of a generation in which there are much more kind of um, like public, visible, um, there's a lot more disability representation in the media. And so they're kind of noticing these tensions between um, kind of disability activists who they know from television or fashion or whatever, um, and then medical models of disability. And I've had many students actually who started out, um, so Vanderbilt has a special education program that's kind of like uh, very historic and renowned. Um, they started out in special education wanting to do something like disability studies, but finding that it didn't have such a cultural focus um, and then coming over to MHS and changing their majors. Um, I also work with a lot of student, a lot of graduate students, um, both at the master's level within our program um, and PhD students um, who come from like anthropology, history, uh, we have a great like community action research department at Vanderbilt. Um, so these are folks who are really interested in um, kind of doing research that focuses on lived experience, um, doing critical research um, that uh, kind of like finds disabled people who have been lost in the archive, things like that. Um, and so they're really interested in uh, kind of learning about critical disabilities and expanding um, their skill set and their tools. 
Um, and then there's like another category of people who um, go to design school and then they come to Vanderbilt to study engineering or they are um, students in our MA program. Um, and um, so it's kind of like going from an applied field to seeking out a theoretical framework, kind of similar to Jonathan, what you were describing about your um, kind of meandering path through uh, medicine and arts and stuff. Um, and, you know, pretty much all of them, I think, leave with more critical perspectives about disability that are informed by like what actual disabled people say about our lives. Thanks, Amy. And I suppose um, for context on this question, um, here at Duke, we have a very large pre-health population of students um, that um, we think our minor will appeal to. Um, but since our minor isn't just health humanities, we're, we're going to have both health humanities and disability studies represented. I think it will have appeal to students in education and design and engineering and many other fields as well. Um, so I'd love to hear about student experiences from the health humanities scholars on the call. Uh, if Aaron and Jonathan wanna jump in. Sure. Um, I think the, the question you initially asked was about you know, what kinds of student interests do these programs appeal to? Um, you know, I think the really obvious answer for health humanities is, is pre-health students, but it's not just pre-med because there are students who want to go on in you know, as PAs and PTs and OTs, um, a whole variety, but, but far beyond that. And I think one of the arguments about the value of health humanities is that um, it can help with retention in many ways because you have students who um, are interested in health professions. They're going to be a doctor. They take OCHEM and it doesn't go so well. Um, and then they're figuring out, well, what next? Right? Uh, health humanities really takes such a broad view um, and, and, and really focuses on just how many different disciplines contribute to health in different ways that I think it's a, a great way for people to, to find a home and find new directions. Um, but beyond, you know, beyond students who are interested in the health professions, health is something that is relevant to, to everybody, right? We are all going to be patients or caretakers. We all pay money into a health system. We all vote on health policy, right? Um, we may end up as health administrators or policymakers or insurance adjusters. And besides those kinds of direct experiences, COVID has made it blindingly clear how central health is to the way that our world works. And so I think the kinds of questions that health humanities and disability studies are, are asking are, are ones that resonate strongly for most everyone in, in our contemporary world. Uh, and I'll say too, that if programs are smart about it, courses that you have in, in, in health humanities or disability studies can usually easily be cross-listed with general education requirements. And so they're these beautiful little gems to attract like STEM majors, like, oh, I can take, I have to get my writing course, but it can be about this, right? Or, um, you know, people who are foreign language students, right? But who's, oh, you know, actually there's kind of like health translation. That's kind of interesting. Um, I think that there are really good ways to attract people from across all parts of the university. And I'll add just one more thing, which is to say, um, along with Sarah Berry, you know, we track the growth of these programs and your, your minor proposal mentioned it. Um, that was actually not the most recent one. I'll put that one in the chat here. Thank you. Um, but actually we're at work on the 2021 update, um, which is measuring how many of these students how many of these programs exist across the country and now in Canada as well. Uh, so last year, we had a total of 102 programs. This year, we've seen programs close down, right? This is, I think, part of the atmosphere of higher education right now and the financial realities of COVID. Um, but at the same time, we still have 116 programs in comparison to the 102 last year's. And if you think about new programs being developed in the humanities, right, that's, that's not something that's happening very broadly, but that growth is continuing to happen within health humanities, I think, in, in pretty impressive ways. And I think that speaks to, you know, what kinds of student interests does it appeal to? Many and broadly. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if Jonathan wanted to add anything there. I'll say a few words. Um, you know, I, I'll, um, 
I'm going to answer as an administrator. Actually, I've, I've been the director of MHS for 10 years now. Um, and I'll say that when I got to Vanderbilt, I recruited to Vanderbilt to kind of grow the program. There was a program in place. Um, but what we had at the time was um, a much more traditional medical humanities kind of model. Um, it was a lot of secondary appointments from other units. Um, and then it was a, a major on the books, but the major was, um, uh, I think, 40 students or, or something like that. And we had an administrator. Um, and one of the arguments, and I realized this is probably particular to Vanderbilt and not other places, is um, we needed to have um, our own lines in the department if we if we could. It was a cent it's been a center for the last decade. But the idea was um, if it was just going to be secondary appointments, and I say this with full respect because it, I've been in many systems, but you ended up, I, I felt like we ended up with a potentially kind of gender dynamic in which one discipline was in the service of the other discipline. It was volunteered time, or it was the role of the English professor to make the pre-med more sensitive, to make them like a surgeon, but whatever. And it had this whole thing of like, it, it was never two disciplines on equal par with each other that had equally validated, institutionally validated, um, you know, trajectories. And so what it was, was like, it just reaffirmed these kind of traditional binaries of like, you know, hard science and soft emotion and all these kinds of things. Um, and so, first of all, um, you know, in taking the job, which is again, not in any way, um, whatever, but we ended up getting our own, our own, we made the unit tenure granting, which I think was a very major in changing that. And then we just kind of went through after we hired a couple of amazing faculty, including the esteemed Professor Hamra here. Um, and we, um, we, re we revamped the major that was on the book so that it wasn't just medical humanities or medical history. And I think three, um, three kind of um, frameworks were the core of that. Um, number one was um, that um, it had to be within the, the value system of what the students brought. In other words, we didn't want to be in the position of just saying, come here and become more sensitive. So even if you're a doctor, you'll be able to read Chaucer and all that kind of stuff. Like to me, that, that it never flies. It's more like we are part of the university also. And if you get a major in our program, it's gonna make you a better person, but it's also gonna make you competitive in what your career goal is after. And so part of it was, we were very much in line with the, um, what are the students end point? Not just what, how can we change them when they're here, but um, how can we help them get into med school more or grad school more, or if you were gonna go into business, um, be critical, but also have a more successful business career. And so number one was that. Number two is we didn't have a framework that was any one discipline or approach. So um, there, it's like medical humanities and politics and sociology, critical race studies, disability, they're a part of many different aspects of MHS, but it's not like we wanted one particular track. So we kind of had that, it was kind of like a show don't tell model in a particular way. And then number three, again, sounded like an administrator is um, we were part of the same economy <laughs> as the rest of the university. So ultimately we had to, it wasn't just, I, I didn't want to get in a position where it was just um, um, like we had to pay, pay, you know, the university responds to how many majors you have and it responds to how many grants you get and it responds to how many donors you have. And we didn't want to say, oh, we, we're, we're a special case and we shouldn't have to play by that economy. So we kind of created an interdisciplinary unit where there were kind of multiple things happening at one time. Um, and, but it was within the economy of, um, you know, we've gotten a lot of grants. We've had a lot of donors. We um, now have, Amy, what is it like 800 majors, something like that. We have a lot of majors. And um, we have a, a master's program that has 25 students a year. Um, we've got um, all these other things. And so it just makes us um, harder to kill <laughs> in a way. Um, and, and so part of the issue was um, we kind of started, I think really not just with the content, but with the endpoint, which is like, what does it take? Forget, forget the topic. What is it? Why do students take majors? And what's the end point they want? And we kind of work backwards. And it turned out um, for the most part, hopefully 
it's been very true to our ideals. But once we had the kind of framework in place, um, then we could um, next then fill in the, the content, which was not just medical humanities to make things more sensitive, but, and I'm just gonna give one number. Um, in 2016, um, our students, we had an 83% acceptance rate to med school in our program, um, which has doubled the national average. Um, and so it was kind of like we could take the same endpoints. We took the endpoints that were not our endpoints. They, they weren't our metrics, but we thought we can play that game. Um, and it turned out that if we combine critical thinking with science, with all these things, um, we could we get metrics that other people cared about. And I think that that's kind of what helped our growth. And uh, a, a decade on, we went from being a center. We're now a department as of last year. So we're um, even harder to kill. Not to, not to say they won't do it. Um, but, I, but I will say that it's kind of like trying to think uh, in a kind of layered way of just about, I guess what I'm saying is, um, it, it's kind of thinking how the university works and then thinking how we can kind of beat them <laughs> at their own game <laughs> in a certain way. Thank you. This is Marion again. Um, all of those responses were so incredibly helpful. I really loved hearing Margaret speak about just the heavy interdisciplinarity of student projects um, that she's seen. Um, and Amy's uh, discussion of just how many different majors it appeals to, um, and also the more, the really encouraging um, administrative picture that uh, Aaron and Jonathan paint of just the level of student interest and the fact of growth. And um, that can be a very persuasive argument to a university that um, is understanding itself as under financial constraints, right? Which I'm sure many and most universities are at the present time. Um, and I know for myself, I'm just thinking about all of the logistic arguments that we will have to make. Um, and uh, so I appreciate Jonathan's comments on just the economy of the university in ways that we can um, imagine speaking to that. Um, but uh, I wonder if we can turn to a discussion of um, how the, the programs that you teach in interact with other programs at the university. Um, so this is a bit of a logistical kind of a question. Um, for us at Duke, one of the things that we've been um, thinking through is just how can we make the argument uh, in a way that is not threatening to other departments that they're not going to be afraid that they're going to lose their students to us, um, particularly within the humanities, because that is an area that is um, like under more decline uh, in terms of enrollment. So, you know, if there's a health humanities program, is that going to take away majors from other humanities departments, or is it actually going to have the opposite effect and, you know, draw students into humanities courses and get enrollment up for those classes um, without necessarily impacting the number of, of majors? Um, so that's something that we're thinking through. Um, and also in terms of how to make the program run affordably, um, we uh, really rely on our interdisciplinarity for that argument because we have faculty who are teaching, you know, in many different departments. And we see this as being like, okay, at first we can just do a lot of cross-listing and a lot of taking advantage of the expertise that's already here. And as it grows, then maybe we'll have a stronger case to make for some new faculty hires, um, but that has to be down the road. Um, so my next question is about um, the interdisciplinarity of disability studies and health humanities. Um, I'd love to hear um, what impacts your programs have had on um, other majors in the broader curriculum of, of your university, how they complement or compete with other majors and departments. Um, and as, as a sort of sub question, um, I would love to hear about the relationship between the university and the medical school um, and, and the role that your program might play in building a bridge uh, between those. Um, so I suppose if I could, if I could just call on people, um, I, I suppose I could start with um, Jonathan, since I know um, there's a medical school at Vanderbilt and you are in that administrator kind of a position. So if you could speak to this question, how does, how does the uh, Medicine Health Society major interact with the rest of the university? Well, as far as other departments, our, our goal is to take them over um, and make them superfluous. Uh, and 
and and I think no, I'm, I I I would say that there there's a kind of sense of this kind of stuff, which is it's it's too um, it's too full, right? Because on one hand, I think that departments, programs, centers in interdisciplinary health studies, disability studies, um, thrive the most um, when they're seen as um, when they're seen as uh, contributors to to disciplines and departments, not competitors. Um, and so in a way, I think you have to really think through and it's much harder, you know, to do that than it is to just think it. In what ways can we make this, um, can we be seen as a resource by the university, um, not as a competitor? Because, I mean, people have been in departments for a long time and that's cool. Um, and you, I just, it, you kind of lose when you have those fights and they're also just not that fun. Um, and, and you get and you gain when people kind of want to join. And so the way you do that is number one, um, you know, you, you have an open, um, you know, we co-host things with as many different units as we possibly can. Um, we have conferences we were going to do before that uh, pandemic thing that um, thankfully is over now. We were going to be the um, health humanities um, thing and, we, and, and, and for people, you know, so we were hosting the health humanities conference last year but we had buy-in from like pretty much every department across campus. And we also try to be really generous as much as possible. Um, there are ways to structurally encourage that relationship. Um, can students um, be co-mentored? Can they have split majors? I mean, anything that's split or divided, I'm a huge fan of because it's, it's, it's in part about the students, but it's much more about the faculty and the departments. Like it kind of gives you a leeway. And so every like couple of years, somebody's like, there should only be one major. And I'm always like, that's a terrible idea because um, it's probably easier for the administrator, but it's, it's much worse for the departments because it doesn't give them an avenue to kind of reflect how, um, how cooperation is. And we are also, um, you know, almost maybe now to a fault, um, friendly to social science. You know, we've got a lot, we've got social science scholars in our, in our department. Um, but I think having having scholars on the same floor in the same unit, it kind of, you know, it, we're kind of trying to show how that stuff works. But I will just honestly admit that it's a daily battle <laughs> um, because the, the you know deans change and chancellors change and other people change, and every time it's it's like that. It's like that, um, you know. It's just I mean, and it's probably true across the world. And I. I don't mind this. I mean, you know, this is probably what people in business or startups or things like that feel, but it's a continual process of, um, you know, revalidating and reproving and pushing back when you have to. Um, but I would say that it, it's never like, oh my God, that job is done. So we are, we're just now cementing some collaborations with the new public policy initiative and with the sociology department and with the history department. Um, but it's the kind of thing that honestly, I'll just say takes a ton of time and effort. Um, and it's bottom up as much as it is top down. Um, the med school, I, I'd be curious to know what Aaron and Margaret and um, have to say about this, just because when I got to Vanderbilt, we were all like, the, they had this one Vanderbilt motto. Um, and now we have the um, everyone for themselves motto, um, which is that all of the schools have gotten divorced from each other. so. Um, we're actually literally, literally from a financial standpoint in competition with the other colleges. Um, there was a divorce uh, from the hospital and the med school. And so what that meant was we had to be much more creative about how to bring physicians over and how to get our students over in the med school. I could talk for a very long time about how we tried to get around that, I think successfully. I'll just say that one of the key areas has been um, thinking about ways that, again, value is a system of valuation for both the med school and for us. So we've written grants that bring in postdocs that have collaborative teaching. We try to get our students on research projects over there, but it used to be a lot easier. We used to have like courses in the emergency room and stuff like that. But the minute, I mean, the med school people are on the, on the same, you know, they have their own economy. And so they had to validate their time and the minute, um, their time wasn't covered anymore by the college. It just made that argument a little bit harder. And so 
I guess the part of it is it's ironic because we're literally five feet away from the med school. Like literally it's just like, right. You know, it's a five minute walk. Um, but, but, but right now the divide is, is, it's take, taking a lot more effort to, to bridge um, just because the economic systems have, have, have split apart and it's much more of a um, competition for resources kind of model. We've, we've been able to get around it, but it's, it's created a lot more, um, a, a lot more creativity than it used to. Thank you, Jonathan. This is Marion again. Um, I wonder, Erin, do you have anything to say about how this works at Case Western? Sure, although um, I have to preface it with, I am still learning. So moving from a small liberal arts college to a school of medicine has, has been really eye-opening, um, very steep learning curve. So we have an undergraduate minor, right? That's housed in the Department of Bioethics, which is in the School of Medicine. Um, but, you know, students are coming from all across the campus. Um, there are politics there that I still don't quite understand that I think have kept the minor as a minor instead of a major because that changes some of the financial arrangements. Um, and yet, you know, there are courses across the College of Arts and Sciences that students can take that will count towards the minor. We have a lot of guest speakers coming in and, and guest speakers speaking in other classes. So there's a lot of collaboration that happens there. I think one of the sort of larger theoretical questions to keep in mind as you talk about like school of medicine versus say College of Arts and Sciences is that uh, it's a question of how critical people can be when you are uh, within the structures that you are perhaps critiquing, right? So Diane Price Herndl raised this question about disability studies and, and health in relation to health humanities. You know that since so much of, of health humanities, medical humanities, um, you know, has really started within medical education. Like, can you bite the hand that feeds you? And it was a question: How critical can you really be if you are part of that school of medicine? Um, I'm happy to say, I have not felt shut down at all, which is great. Um, yeah, I don't think that really answers your question so much, but I do wanna say one other thing in response to sort of your larger umbrella question, which is that I, I know the fear that the health humanities program is going to drain students away from other humanities majors is one that I hear from a lot of different institutions. There's not really data that exists yet, I think that can say definitively, like does that happen or not? But anecdotally, I think the reverse is often true. Um, that what happens is you get STEM students who take a course, right, that's grounded in humanities or arts or social sciences methodologies that they wouldn't have taken if it didn't have health in the title or something. And then they find out this is really interesting, right? And so they actually go out then and seek, seek further courses. So I, I don't think that it has proven to be um, a drain. I think more often it is... Um, a way to, to in fact, maybe not drain, but uh, to add on to, to STEM students' experiences, um, all, all the rich things that the rest of the university has to offer. Um, thank you. And, and finally, Margaret, do you have any, uh, anything to, to comment on about Ohio State University? Thank you. So much. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, um... Uh, I'll, I'll refrain from commenting on some of the more complicated uh, dynamics around OSU's management of student quote unquote wellness, which really isn't doesn't have anything to do with the way the, the medical center is uh, managed or um, or staffed or certainly doesn't have anything to do with the people working there. Uh, the theme of collaboration is a huge one. Um, I heard both Jonathan and Aaron uh, refer to that and that's been um, one of the key things that I've been working with since I arrived at Ohio State five years ago. Um, and I uh, tried to think about what are some of the ways that disability studies can make sense to people in units like the Center for Ethics and Human Values or uh, the Design Department or the School of Agriculture. Uh, and um, some of the collaborations that we've engaged in are um, kind of wild, but it's pretty exciting to see all the different ways that projects that are centered in the question of disability 
uh, proliferate all over the school. Um, and when I'm able, I like to really focus those on ways that um, give people a tangible sense of this is adding something, this is bringing value. Um, I've gotten very comfortable with announcing that something is a value add. Uh, you know, I think we all have our, our favorite little administrator speak that we that we save up. And one of mine is look at the value add. Uh, so, for example, the Society for Disability Studies Conference uh, is now coming into its fourth year. Uh, being hosted at Ohio State. Uh, and last year we had to move the whole thing from a planned in-person conference to an online conference. And we were able to do that. Um, uh, student organizations focused on disability are largely uh, the reason we have such an exciting array of speakers um, for disability studies, including uh, Amy Hamray, uh, and also including Sammy Shock. Uh, Gina Kim, um, Diana Lewis, uh, just a, an array of speakers that um, the Disability Studies program by itself never would be able to host, but um, with co-sponsorships and partnerships, um, you know, like a lot of large universities, Ohio State sometimes has uh, tiny units where there's people working very hard and have almost no money. And then there's sometimes other units where people have a chunk of money and they're sort of going, how can I spend this? Uh, you know, like, how can this look good? How can this really uh, go with my, my center's mission? Mm -hmm. It takes a huge amount of work to foster collaborations like that. That's the one theme I think I keep coming back to uh, in terms of trying to build programs uh, in disability studies, those partnerships take so much time. And some of the time required is just building goodwill, thinking about the ways that translation can work between, for example, uh, critical disability studies and a discipline that's actually called speech pathology. Um, another uh, thing that has been really important that you pointed out is addressing the issue of is there competition? And if there is, what are the metrics of that competition? Every university has its own way of uh, saying this is valuable, this is not. Um, for example, enrollments at Ohio State occupy a very weird relationship to budgets. Um, it's not a straightforward butts and seeds formula. Um, but insofar as uh, we can decipher what's important in terms of enrollments, it's really important to me to assure my English colleagues, uh, the students that are piling into disability studies classes, which tend to over-enroll, are mostly not coming from your English classes. They are coming from disciplines other than English. And then always really being able to back that up and say, here are the numbers, I did look into it, this is how it works. Um, the last thing that I wanna mention in terms of collaboration is, uh, Thinking about, uh, and this was another thing that felt really important to me upon arrival, thinking about what my potential collaborator values most. And this is why I ended up being co-PI of the Transformative Access Project. Um, I had been working with a colleague, Maurice Stevens, who um, at the time was working very, uh, very doing very focused work on um, the concept of equity. And uh, they and I had a series of sort of chats and, and uh, hangouts together. Um, and we realized that what Maurice tends to define as equity, I tend to define following Amy's work as critical access. Um, so they and I started the collaborative, uh, the transformative access project together with a uh, to other people. And we ultimately decided upon the phrase transformative access as the name for the project. But the key thing was that all of us had already been working for years and were deeply invested in the notion of equity, resolving health disparities, resolving societal uh, sort of sticky societal problems. And we wanted to put them together under this umbrella uh, and sort of create, we got a, a grant to do this. Um, and we wanted to create something that would be legible to the university as um, 
we are not siloed from each other. We are finding each other and we are working together. And so that's one reason why we built a website. It's not a huge project. It does not require a website, uh, but we wanted to really be noticeable as um, we are sticking together uh, and kind of making a show of those solidarity moves, I think can be very persuasive at the Dean uh, Provost University level. Thank you. This is Marion again. Um, all of those responses give us so much to think about. Um, I want to um, take a second to just acknowledge the time. So this event goes until five. It's now 440. Um, if folks in the audience have questions that they would also like to ask, please just pop those into the chat and um, we can make space for them. Or you can use the raise hand feature, um, which I'm going to try and make sure I can keep an eye on everyone by kind of scrolling through my participants list. And so if I, if I don't see you right away, then maybe just like put something in the chat to just get my attention. Um, but we'd love to hear uh, from folks in the audience. Um, I actually, yeah, I see a hand from my colleague, Carrie Stewart, my fellow co-director in the Health Humanities Lab. Carrie, you wanna go ahead? Hi, thanks, Marion. Uh, my name is Kersley Carrie Stewart. I'm really thrilled to be here and just have enjoyed every minute um, of, the, of the conversation so far, which has focused on the challenges that he, we're facing right now to create the space and the acceptability for this program. But I wanna put us into a space of we've gotten there, we've achieved it. Now, what do we look like and what are we gonna do when we get there? And that brings me all the way to the beginning when Erin mentioned one of the things that excited her about this was that there's never a single kind of survey course that you have to take or you have to teach, that there's so much eclectedness and interdisciplinarity in this space. One thing that uh, Marion uh, and Neil and our other uh, co-director, Jahan, have been struggling with is, do we offer a survey course? Do we offer a capstone course? How do we shape this um, program? And I just wanted to get thoughts from you guys about the value of trying to create a coherent or to put, package it together in a survey course, in a capstone. What are the features of a certificate, I think, um, or a minor that you think are essential? And of course, also understanding that we're trying to bring disability studies and health humanities together um, as a way to sort of move the agendas forward together. So that's my question. What should we look like? Um, so that is a wonderful question, Carrie. And um, I, as, an, as a sort of access thing, I'm calling on our panelists rather than just leaving it open to anyone to jump in. Um, so I, I actually wonder if, if Amy might comment on this because um, I'm thinking about what it means to be a disability studies scholar in a program that is not explicitly disability studies and, and how um, that can, can work in and the extent to which um, your, your course on theories of the body, do you see that as functioning like a survey course or like an intro kind of a course? Or I don't know if we wanna start with you in response to Carrie's questions. This is Amy. Um, these are really good questions. I think that, you know, there are strategic reasons um, to have very general course titles sometimes because they attract more students and also more people can teach them. So, um, you know, you both uh, get away from the idea of a canon, which can be a very limiting um, approach, um, and you expand access. Um, so I, I mean, I like that there isn't just like one core course in MHS. Um, I think we have like five or six that students can choose from as their core course requirement. And one is like masculinity, like men's studies, and one is theories of the body and ones like COVID and society and stuff like that. Um, I also think it's really valuable to have dedicated courses that do make their commitments explicit. And I think it's good to have both. So 
Um, you know, right now, I think a lot of my students may not know that there's a whole field called critical disability studies that they could go to graduate school in, for example. Um, and I think that having like a dedicated course for that achieves that. Um, and I think that both of these things can live together because in terms of the politics of the university and kind of um, apportioning funding and things like that, like you kind of need one to support the other. Um, and this is something I really learned when I was at Emory uh, doing my graduate studies. Um, you know, there, there was this uh, kind of traumatic event that happened when I was in my last year of my PhD, which is that the university cut like half of the departments just overnight and wouldn't tell anybody why that was happening. But, you know, we know now that this is the thing that happens. And um, disability studies had really been cultivated um, so strongly within all of the departments across the university that when those cuts happened, the fact the tenured faculty were kind of shifted around very, very unfortunately, the non-tenured faculty had their lines cut. Um, and, you know, this is like a very like ambivalent statement that I'm making, like disability studies uh, still continue to exist. And um, I think it was because uh, it hadn't like located itself in a particular canon. So I think that there are reasons to have both. Um, and, you know, you kind of want to be able to be there to be able to do the work, um, even though there are very unfortunately conditions of scarcity. Um, Aaron, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I do. Thank you. This is Aaron. Um, so I said at the beginning that there really, you know, isn't a kind of standard curriculum. Um, I should say too that this is an ongoing project of the Health Humanities Consortium to try to begin to maybe set some guidelines, not a canon, but if somebody has a, a degree in health humanities, they will have been exposed to at least X ideas, right? Or, or have attained X sort of skills. Um, so beginning to think through that with a, with a large constituent of people. Not having had those um, guidelines in place has allowed programs, I think, to build more easily because they, they build out of faculty interests and passions and what already exists. But one of the key challenges, I think, when you have programs that are so often cobbled together, um, is how do you how do you ensure that students who, who go through these programs have some kind of common experience? You know, if I have a health humanities minor, what does that actually mean, right? And if you have students who are taking entirely different coursework, it's hard to say that. Um, so for purposes of assessment in particular, I think um, having at least some common experiences for the students who, who go through these paths is, is important. Um, and if your institution makes you do assessment diligently, right, then you're going to have to have these kinds of common checkpoints throughout. Um, if also, as we think about you know, high impact practices, as the AAC and you would name them, having those kinds of common experiences or having capstone experiences, having um, service learning maybe integrated throughout, these kinds of things are really natural to health humanities, but also really, really valuable practices for students. Yeah, um, this is Marion again. And um, a lot of that does really sound exactly like the conversation that we've been having in the Health Humanities Lab. It's a question of if we are offering students this menu of, of courses across disciplines that they can take, where is the commonality? And um, we had proposed doing a gateway and a capstone. At least that's our thinking as of now. This is this is subject to change given um, feedback from participating uh, faculty members, etc. Um, but uh, I, I think that it's important to not have a canon, but at least a shared sense of principles for the courses involved. And this is something that um, reminds me of Margaret's question earlier of what does it mean to 
be doing disability studies, but also taking a class that has the word pathology in it, right? Um, and, and that's, yeah, that's a question that, that we're thinking through as well um, when we decide which courses to um, include. Um, Margaret, please add to this. Yes, I just wanted to add something really quickly. I know you have other questions waiting, um, but what you've just named is uh, exactly the model that um, we ended up adopting at OSU, partly by necessity, because we have a lot of classes uh, and a lot of instructors and not a lot of people to administer the instructors. Uh, I came up uh, as a scholar after my MFA in rhetoric and composition, where the bread and butter course is first year writing. Now, typically the first year writing course uh, comes with a few assumptions. Um, it's typically not taught as a content course. That is, it's not assumed to be a survey or a course that will contain any particular text. Um, in fact, often the only texts used are text students generate themselves. And what you're teaching instead are um, habits of mind, um, a way of sort of critically getting hold of uh, what we call writing. Um, and there's also, uh, by long tradition in rhetoric and composition, an explicit training for the people teaching this first year course, which uh, is interesting since a lot of other disciplines uh, do not have explicit training for teaching anything <laughs> in the discipline. Uh, so I followed that model for our disability studies minor. Anybody teaching our intro course uh, has to do the disability studies pedagogy workshop um, with me, it's I typically co-teach it with someone else. And uh, they can theme the course whatever they want. Um, they don't need to include any particular text. They don't need to use any particular topic. So we've had courses focused on movement and migration, courses focused on critical captioning, courses focused on uh, disability and mobility. Uh, there are just so many different ways of getting hold of the notion of quote unquote, introducing disability studies. But the key to me is that we're all, we have all come together to work on what do we mean by teaching this? And what are, can we come to a list of shared objectives, uh, but not mandate the content or the curriculum or what kinds of assignments you use? Great. Um this is Marion. I see Neil Prose, my other co-director of the Health Humanities Lab. Go ahead, Neil. Sure. Thanks, Marion. Uh, Neil Prose, I'm one of the co-directors and also uh, teach at the medical school and also uh, first semester freshman undergraduates. And uh, one of the questions I keep wondering about is how, if, when we get to this minor and it all succeeds, uh, do you all have any models for how to say this, like advice, particularly the pre-med students, do you, do you work with them to help them fashion their goals and their careers and, and their plans? Do you have a way of kind of advising them along the way? Because a lot of the kind of pre-med advice that comes through the normal channels of pre-med advising is uh, sometimes it falls short of what the, patient, what the patients, what the students really need. I'm wondering if you have experience with that whole kind of thing. Jonathan, do you want to start us off? Well, I was going to see if Amy had anything to say about advising. Um, <laughs> no, it's uh, it's hard. I mean, this part's hard. And Neil, I love that you said patience. That it's, uh, that, that is how I feel sometimes. But but I would say that um, you know it, it's hard, right? Because you're advising in very different ways, and a lot of times the the um, and and we're let me just be clear: we're forty percent pre med, and we're sixty percent everything else in the world, and so. You really have to kind of create good strategic alliances with the advising infrastructure of the university. Um, and, and I can't say this clearly enough, beside the advising, um, you know, COVID has changed the economy that our students are going into. So I've personally added professionalization components to pretty much everything I'm, I'm teaching. Um, like um, I'm doing a master's uh, seminar this uh, term and it was a, a um, journal club kind of seminar. And now it's a, how is the pandemic changing blank industry? And let's bring in people from that industry. Um, so I think it's incumbent on us to think about endpoints because I mean, I just honestly can't imagine what it would feel like to be a college student right now or a grad student and be entering this crazy economy. It's not just about 
the economy itself. It's also like all the rules that our curriculum and our university structure have been built on are, um, are up for grabs. And so we're learning at the same time. And so advising has to be a very dynamic process. It can't just be like, you know, here's the end point and that kind of thing. It's also like a challenge for us as university people to figure out what the, what the, like what I, you know, why people go to college is, is different now than it was three years ago because of the pandemic and stuff. And so part of it is to bring the advising into classes, into other kind of structures. Um, and then the other part is, um, I don't know, Amy, can you help me here? We're, we get overwhelmed because <laughs> there's, there's so much need just with our own thing that it's, it's a kind of constant effort to, um, how can we kind of streamline the, the advising in a way just to, for, I mean, that, that's in part, I'm going to um, second what Margaret said. I don't love tons of required courses or capstone courses or anything like that because it just creates too much bureaucracy and, um, and, and people are going to find it. I mean, hopefully they're going to come through your curriculum and get the skills you want them to without them having to take this one class or that other class. So even as we try to keep things as open and flexible as possible, it does feel like there's a lot of advising to be done. Amy, you want to throw me a life preserver here? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is Amy. I can say, you know, at Vanderbilt, our students are required to come for advising meetings every semester, just something I'd never encountered before. Um, and so that means that we're meeting with like 800 students, like in the middle of every semester as they're signing up for courses which is a lot. Um, and we definitely try to figure out ways to uh, reduce the, cogn the cognitive load of that. But one thing that I really appreciate about that is it's also like a place for making certain interventions. So it's like the place, maybe the only place where some students have someone tell them like, hey, slow down, it's okay. Like you don't have to, you don't have to carry all of that. You don't have to like retake biochem three times to try to increase your science GPA. Um, maybe you wanna do something else that feels more easeful. And, um, or maybe like, you know, there, maybe you have some like internalized ableism to work through. Let's like talk about some resources for that. And so I feel like a lot of disability studies work actually like happens in advising um, with a lot of my students. And that's like the benefit of having that kind of face-to-face -face interaction. On the other hand, I'm not a therapist. I'm totally not equipped for the like emotional um, stuff that comes with a lot of that. And I do wish there was more support around that. But, um, but you know, in our structure, it does mean that um, students are getting, you know, there are pre-med students that are getting advised by me. I never took biochemistry. I just like have information that I give them and help them navigate their major and stuff. Um, so there may be something in that too. And if I could add to that, like it also helps you see the pressures that they're under. Like it actually gives you a lot of empathy. Like I do the, I do the freshman orientation. It's their second night of college and you kind of go hang out with them on their dorm or you used to before the pandemic. And I, the first question is always like, how you feel about being in college? And you go around a circle of like 50 students and like 40 of them will be like, what GPA do I need to work at Goldman Sachs or something like that? And it's like, it's your second night of college. Like, you know, you're supposed to like run around and get arrested and set off the sprinkler, sprinkler system and stuff like that. Um, and, um, and, and so, it, but it's so much pressure. And, it, and, and I think it's important to recognize that pressure. And, and in a way that advising, it kind of gives you a feel of like, just the, it, it's hard to be a student. It really is. And so it kind of lets you do exactly like Amy's saying, which is to say, um, okay, we can figure this out in a way. So. Okay. So um, Margaret, please. Uh, I just, this is just a very quick addition. Um, one of the main things I find myself talking to students about is the culture of the various professions or uh, graduate schools they might go into so uh, I am far from an expert on this, but medical schools have a specific, you know, each one has a specific culture. Medical education in itself has norms and traditions and discourses. Uh, if anyone's ever counseled a student through the process of trying to get accommodations for taking the MCAT, you know that that is harder than the MCAT itself. 
Uh, and then uh, humanities PhDs have their own <laughs> spotty cultures. So one thing I wanted to just mention was to go along with what folks have been saying, uh, a lot of these conversations have to do with um, just saying, be aware that you're going into specific kinds of worlds. And if the language and the customs seem weird or sometimes even punitive, it's not you. Um, and you may wish to navigate that or you may wish not to, but um, those things you're bumping into are not, they're not coming from you. Thank you all so much. Um, so it is nearly five o'clock. Um, if there are any last questions from the audience, now is the time, but um, I suppose we can start wrapping up and concluding. And I just want to say, um, I love that we've ended this on uh, the topic of, of empathy and, and the ways that this can generate empathy between faculty and students and just helping us to understand better the choices that are in front of them. Um, and also how we have sort of ended in a place of considering the emotional labor um, and the, the actual labor of um, just running, not as it, emotional labor is not actual labor, um, but the work of administering these programs. Um, and, and so I really appreciate all that you've contributed. We really appreciate all of your insights and may continue having this conversation um, into the future. So thank you all so much um, for your time today. We'll do a little um, round of applause visually here. Thank you. Amy. Thank you so much for this space, Marion and Eli. Thank you, of course, you're welcome. Your minor thank is you. excellent. It should yeah. absolutely get approved. Thanks, Erin, I hope so.